And yeah, take it, take it away, Reagan. Thank you so much. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. And I just wanna make sure that everybody can see that okay. Uh, maybe a thumbs up just for okay or a nod. I'm seeing some thumbs ups and nods. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for being here today and, and being able to spend time today and share space today and share emotion today and share um, collective interest in, in coming together around these issues. Um, I, uh, you did a lovely, thank you for the introduction. Uh, you know, I, I don't feel like I need to offer any more insight into uh, myself. My name is Begun Wise. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the coordinator at the Climate Hub. Um, and I'm all of those things that you heard in the bio as well. And I'm also, I, I, I start this, um, my, my work here also with a, a land acknowledgement. And so I, today I'm located at the uh, UBC Vancouver uh, campus. And I understand that UBC is situated amid and upon the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. And also understanding that UBC, oh, I grew up in the Okanagan Valley, and UBC, oh, is also uh, part of the UBC institution, recognizing the extent of this institution into uh, Okanagan territory as well. And in what is currently called Canada, I'm humbled by the depth and scope of time that Indigenous communities have thrived in relationship with these lands and continue to thrive in relationship with these lands. 20 plus thousand years or what we might call deep time or time immemorial. There's some work machines going back and forth behind me, so if you can hear that, I apologize. Um, and this idea of, of land acknowledgement, this practice of land acknowledgement um, needs to go beyond the words into the tangible. And so thinking about how we create a tangible understanding of land acknowledgements. And I came across an article that was written out of UBCO called Grounding Wellness, uh, Coloniality, Placism, Land, and a Critique of Social Determinants of Indigenous Mental Health in a Canadian Context. And there was a section in that that really struck me as a, a wonderful way to ground ourselves in uh, this process that we're going to move through today together. And so I'm just going to read this um, excerpt to, to uh, the community here today. And it says, take a deep breath. Cast your eyes down toward the ground, toward the land, to the weeds, downward to the muck and mud and dirt upon which your feet tread every day. Cast your eyes downward upon that which you walk. Notice the puddles and the intricacies of soil. Notice the wildlife of weeds springing up between cracks and pavement. Notice patterns in water scars, plants and dust, snails and the footprints of birds, tire tracks and windswept leaves. As Linda Zuwal Suwali uh, Smith writes, people who are indigenous to specific places, lands, ground, territory, have no other homeland to reference, no other territories to which they might consider returning. Indigenous people, though deeply heterogeneous and greatly varied, are in of place, anchored in a connection to homelands, even if separated from those homelands upon which their kinship and genealogical beings stretch back beyond time itself. Associated with this groundedness of indigeneity is an undeniable truth that many indigenous people have asserted, namely that they have an orientation to the world that is fundamentally rooted in land, water, and ecologies. This is what some indigenous scholars, activists, and knowledge holders call an ecology of knowledge or theology of place. This knowledge is what is feeling so much of the land back movement in Canada and beyond. Don't go after it, Megan. Land back is not a turn of phrase or metaphoric reference. Land back is literal, material, ground-bound statement, and it is inseparable from the bodies, the human beings, the people who are calling for it. Land back, land back, land back is about health and well-being. Land back is embodied. Land back is felt, lived, and experienced. Land back is mental and physical and spiritual and emotional survivance and health. Land back recognizes that deterritorialization or the forcible removal of indigenous peoples from land and territory has been fundamental to the Euro-colonial project of nation and state building. Deterritorialization 
has had and continues to have resonant and devastating impacts on Indigenous mental health and wellness, which is why it is important for you to take a moment and look toward the earth, to territory, to territory, territory which might be stolen and occupied, toward the ground, toward the small and all too often overlooked. And so I, I offer that um, to community just as we get started here today as a way to practice grounding, as a way to reflect on land, the importance of land and why calls for land back are not just words, but material in many ways. And so thinking about us and the work that we do in service of that. And I also have slides. I have I, get, I got caught up in the in the um, in the words. Uh, but here's here's a, a map that oversees different territories, the overlapping nature of that, and recognizing that boundaries and borders are a complex thing. Uh, so in our time today, I just want to quickly go over the process that we're moving through today, and we're going to quickly go into a bit of a stretch and breathe to get us started. Uh, we're going to ground ourselves in some care. We're going to move through some terminology, some community reflections. We're going to explore some lenses for navigating climate emotions and work, um, thinking about climate doom, hope, and boundaries. Um, and we're going to talk about some strategy sharing and self-compassion uh, in relationship to these themes that we're exploring today. And I also just want to double uh, check in that um, for those who might need closed captioning, that is enabled. So if you need that, please use that at your discretion. If there's any other accessibility needs or if there's uh, issues that you're having, if your audio cuts out or there's something um, going on that is making our process today inaccessible, please uh, put it in the chat or put a hand up. We're happy to stop and make sure that you feel um, grounded in this process together today. And I'll just give folks a chance to enter something into the chat if you need to, just for us to be aware. If there is a chat um, that I'm not seeing in the moment, please uh, also let me know. And uh, happy to stop and, and uh, just deal with the chat as well as we go. Okay, so for folks who are comfortable please leave your screen on if that's good for you. If you're not comfortable doing breathing and stretching um, in, in front of folks, I encourage you to turn your, turn your screen off so that you feel like you can take this moment uh, and be present with yourself, grounded in the moment. Um, and we're just going to actually stretch our bodies for a quick moment. I know all of us are going to be at some point in our day, we're navigating different things and different experiences. And so I'm gonna give us an opportunity to stretch. And um, I'm gonna leave my camera on so that folks can just be part of that process, but I'm just gonna do kind of like a cat stretch. And again, depending on your body's needs, your body's mobility, um, what feels good, what feels right, you can stretch in any way that feels good. You can stretch your toes, your legs, your torso up, your spine up, your arms up, but I'm just gonna do a bit of a cat stretch and just do the back over because I always find that feels so good. Ah. Ah, okay. And I always do that too. I kind of do that, like stretch my shoulders in and out because sometimes I realize that I've just been sitting at my computer and just, or just holding so much tension in and around my shoulders and body and stretching is just a really beautiful way to come back to our own bodies and recognize where we're at. And the next thing I'm going to ask us to do is we're just going to do a bit of a box breath and a box breath is just four counts in, hold for four counts and breathe out for four counts. And again, this is just a way to take a minute and take a pause as we move into these conversations and into these themes together today in a way that feels good, that feels right for you, that feels centered and calm, um, if that's something that, that comes through this breath. So I'm just going to count as we do it. So we're going to breathe in for four counts together. Hold. And breathe out. And if you need to do that again, do it again. Breathe in for four, hold for four, and breathe out for four. And giving our, ourselves this time to embody these types of practices is really important for thinking about the issues of climate distress, climate anxiety, climate grief. 
um, our bodies hold that in so many different ways. And so giving ourselves some tools and strategies to physically process those feelings and emotions and energy is really important as well. So this gives us a chance to practice that as a group and community. And I just want to ground us in our space today. I recognize that we're talking about emotions, we're talking about feelings, we're talking about climate anxiety, climate distress. Um, and so I really want to start with just grounding ourselves in a shared space, recognizing that we're exploring complex and emotional themes together today. Um, there's lots of feelings and emotions, different lived experiences, different reasons for different emotions, and that's good and valid. Um, take time to step back if you need to, ground yourself, do a stretch, do a box breath if you need to, um, to feel safe and cared for today in this space as we talk about our climate emotions or grief or trauma or anxiety. Um, there's no right way or wrong way to feel our climate change emotions or, or connected feelings. Um, your feelings are valid. They're, they're what you have and why you have them is valid. And so there's no right or wrong way to navigate that. Um, and we're coming together today with a purpose to support each other with care and dignity. So recognizing that everyone uh, is owed dignity and everyone uh, here in this space is, is cared for and, and share, share that uh, feeling and, and good nature and goodwill towards everyone in this space today. Uh, sharing vulnerability is welcome uh, and, and respected in our time to get together today. So vulnerability is something we're, we're generally taught to hide or not show, and um, we're all vulnerable, and, and that's okay. And how do we support each other in that vulnerability? And personal stories stay, collective lessons are an offering to take with you. So if anyone shares something personal, um, that's, that's their personal story, but what lessons can you take from that? And I'm gonna ask folks to um, engage if, if you're able or interested. Um, I'm gonna put um, I'm gonna put something in the chat here. And it's a link to a Jamboard. And on that Jamboard, I'm just gonna move my screen around so that I can actually see what I'm doing here too. It's gonna to look like this. And I'm just gonna, move my screen here so that we can see what's going on. And it just says care needs. And if folks are having trouble accessing that Jamboard or um, not sure how to use the Jamboard, what this is, it's anonymous. So when you log in, uh, we don't know who you are. And there's little sticky notes on the side here. Uh, this little thing where my, my, little, my, or my little cursor is over top the little hand and it says sticky note. And if you click on one of those, it will pop up a tab like that for you. And you can just type on that. And what we're exploring today is what, what are your care needs? Uh, we often don't have conversations about what we need to take care of ourselves as kind of common community practice. And we hear a lot about self-care, but what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, what does that look like in, in shared practice as well? So being able to share that on um, a Jamboard, for example, helps other people see care practices maybe that they hadn't considered or, or recognized that might be good for them or helpful for them or, or nurturing for them. And so this is an opportunity for us to do some crowd sharing on different care strategies that folks engage. And examples of care needs might be your emotional needs. What is, what is that? What does that mean? What does that look like? What do you need to support your emotional needs? Social needs, subsistence needs, cultural needs, spiritual needs, accessibility needs, health and physical needs, um, meaning needs, a sense of purpose, for example, or hope, and wishes and future thinking needs. So I'm just going to click back on here. And anything that strikes you as something that you're needing in this moment or in your life or this week, um, it doesn't have to be profound, it can be small, but just something that strikes you as, as a care need that would be useful or helpful to you. I see somebody saying to let myself rest from climate action sometimes. Yes. And we're going to talk about that. Yeah. To apply the word sustainable to my own work. Yes.
And if folks are not wanting to use the Jamboard, please, you're more than welcome to use the chat as well if, uh, if you're okay with being identified in the chat as connected to your name. To smell and feel nature is another one. I love the smell component of that. Um, I need spaces and uh, transportation that are not cold from air conditioning. Okay, so yeah, being understanding the different needs of, of what that can look like in heat and um, different times of year as well. Yes, time in nature, somebody says. Connecting with community of people also doing the work. And as I move on, please feel free to keep adding. Anytime there's a prompt or, or something like that, please feel free to just keep typing and, and reflecting on that as I move forward. Um, but I wanna make sure folks have a chance to share what's actually um, coming to you in these moments. In the chat, somebody says more conscious community and continued emotional support from peers. Listening to the local indigenous language being spoken. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the slides here, but um, like I said, I, I invite folks to keep going for what makes sense to you as we keep moving through this. And I wanna to quickly touch on terminology because sometimes um, we talk about terms with the assumption people know what we're talking about, or there might be different understandings or assumptions about what that means. Um, and that's not to say we have to have a universal understanding, but just to ground ourselves in, if I use this terminology, if I use this language, what does that mean? What am I implying uh, with some of the terms that I use? And so up on the slide here, I have things like climate and eco-anxiety. I have them side by side, but recognizing they're not, they're similar and, and interconnected, but they actually are distinct as well. So thinking about um, this anxiety, climate and eco-anxiety could be a state of ongoing fear, stress, anxiety resulting from pa past, present, or future climate or ecological impacts and processes. So thinking about climate anxiety as related to the impacts and drivers of climate change, whereas eco-anxiety might be more of a direct focus on the eco ecological impacts that we're seeing as a result of climate change. So interconnected, but also unique in their own ways. Then we also have climate and eco-denial. So thinking about there's multiple layers to this as well. So our own um, potential climate eco denial could be just blocking out bad environmental news. Your brain kind of saying, I can't emotionally handle this. I can't cognitively deal with this right now. And so shutting that off or avoiding that. There's also, you know, uh, different flavors of um, climate denialism when it comes to the science or um, policy or different things like that. So we can think about denial from different lenses and leverage points and things. Um, so nostalgia is one that folks may or may not heard of. And it's this idea of pain or distress caused by the sense of uh, desolation of people's you know, emotional feelings because it's connected to desolation and uh, destruction of landscape. So losing spaces around you that feel very deeply connected to you. So for example, I grew up in the Okanagan Valley and the loss of our local forests is such a profound impact. And seeing that gives me a sense of soul nostalgia. But then we also have these different words like uh, copathy, which is shared feelings such as joy or sorrow. And I think so many of us feel that, which is the shared understanding of climate sorrow or this shared understanding of like climate joy when we come together to take action. And it's this sense of, of collective joy. But then there's also these terminologies that are coming into being um, and, and youth creating new language to identify or, or connect with um, climate issues and impacts. So this, um, Chu Hol Sol is uh, a word that was created. It's, it's a mixture of the words dirty, wow, sun. And this was created by, uh, it was a, a new term created by uh, youth in LA from El Salvadorian, uh, Korean and Spanish backgrounds to remind them of what they have in common. And I thought that was a really beautiful coming together of communities to explore new language to have shared experiences. And it was this idea of the sun going down in the LA, um, the LA sunset into the dirty sky going into the sea. Um, so yeah, I thought that was an interesting one to share. 
And as we move through this process today, um, I'm going to be moving through some reflective uh, prompts. And I just want folks to either write it down, chat it, um, uh, or like uh, type it out personally. You don't have to put it in the chat or anything. Um, and yeah, sorry. <laughs> so nostalgia with another I. Yeah, that's, that's me not spelling. Um, and so for here, um, I want this to be a reflective prompt process that we can move through together. And I'm just gonna kind of plant these questions as seeds for us to reflect on. And the first seed that we're gonna plant is, how are climate change issues impacting places I feel connected to? So we just heard that term solastalgia and we just heard you know, LA youth creating terms to have a reflective feeling about watching LA sunsets in relationship to climate change. And so sharing how are climate change issues impacting places I feel connected to? And there's kind of a sub prompt here is how is climate change hurting the people, places or things I value and care about? And I'm just gonna give like 30 seconds to a minute for folks to um, just process that for a second. And like I said, you can either free write if you have something near you, you can type it out on a Word doc on your computer. Or you just let your mind drift into that question for a minute. You're welcome to write it in the chat if you would like. I, I just want to remind folks um, that we are recording. So if you don't mind your reflections being captured in any way, shape or form, um, I welcome folks to add in the chat if you like. This is also just kind of reflective uh, seed planting for conversations at the end as well. So I welcome folks to share as much or as little as you feel called to today. Mm. Yes, I'm also glad your friend is okay. That is scary. I'm just seeing your, your comment in the chat there. Yeah, those are and those those are those feelings that that percolate. Okay, I'm gonna move on to this um, next question as or like this, this kind of idea of climate distress and trauma because I'm seeing a couple of folks um, put stuff in the chat here about impacts and this idea of you know scary situations unfolding, um, thinking about forest fire risks and things like that as well. And so one of the things um, that we're really conscious of is, um, Oh, I don't know how that came up on there. Um, so one of the things that I'm really conscious of is it's really important to, uh, to stress that the feelings and emotions that many are having as a result of climate change processes and impacts, they're entirely normal. Um, these feelings and emotions are expected. They're an expected response to what we are witnessing and experiencing. So for example, those extreme storms or the forest fires that we're witnessing across the nation. Um, and if you're feeling such climate impacts, please know you are not alone in feeling these feelings and emotions. And there's nothing pathologic or like pathological or wrong about these feelings, so to speak. Climate anxiety and grief are valid and rational. They're rational responses to legitimate threats and that, that we see posed by climate change processes and impacts. And in many ways, these feelings that we feel, this anxiety, this grief, this dread, these fears, these, this scariness, um, in many ways, these feelings might be reframed as evidence of our deep love and care for the planet, for our communities, for nature, for other species. And we feel these feelings because we do see ourselves as deeply caring. We do hold love for what we see out in the world. And we understand ourselves to be a connected part of that. And so recognizing those relationships between our, 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 our really intense emotions and this deeper seed of care and love, I think is really important. 
So how do we think about grounding ourselves in that care and that love as we also process and navigate these more complex feelings? Because it's really important that when we're thinking about or discussing issues or impacts of, of climate change, that we don't get stuck or consumed by these feelings of anxiety or fear or dread or grief. And that we also make room for hope and joy and optimism and a collective sense of solidarity and possibility for better and more just communities and futures and thriving. I don't know why, can folks also see that it says species extinction on my screen. Can folks see that as well? Yeah, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Don't worry about it. <laughs> It's just like on my screen and I have no idea where it came from or how it got there. <laughs> um, you know what, I'm gonna stop sharing. Oh, there, I'm not sure where how that happened. Okay, um, oh, clear annotations, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so, oops, I'm going all over the place here. So in relationship to that idea of our feelings and our emotions, um, I want, you know, because we were talking, the first prompt was how we see climate impacting our lives and communities. What are those physical things? And somebody mentioned wildfires, somebody mentioned tornadoes. Um, we see smoke pollution, we see flooding, uh, we see drought. BC is going through a drought right now, for example. Um, so then going back to our feelings about that and thinking about climate change. So how does climate change make you feel or how does climate change make me feel? And so I just want folks to think about that for a second as well. And I'm sure there's lots of different emotions that might come. And so again, more than welcome to add them in the chat or just, just acknowledge them. Just take a minute to let yourself identify and name those feelings you might be having. Mm, deep grief. And I, I recognize that the deep is very like bolded there. Um, it's core. It gets to the core. I hear you. And as you think about how climate change issues and impacts of climate change make you feel. The little sub prompt here too is how do these feelings affect my well-being or thoughts about the future? And the idea of well-being can land however that makes sense for you. Again, there's no right or wrong way to understand well-being. It's, it's personal, it's situational, it's contextual. Um, pissed off, I see that. Yeah, angry. Yeah, yeah. Rage, absolutely. Anger, frustration. I see a lot of that. That's something I actually hear a lot from communities, um, especially when when there's workshops being done with um, youth between like 15 to 20, 22, I would say there's a lot of rage. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of sorrow and it's just swirling together. Yeah, rage, frustration, hopeless. Yeah, I see these words and thank you for naming them. Thank you for sharing and being willing to express what is what is taking root inside. And sharing this is really helpful because I see I see words in here that I feel and I recognize I'm not alone. I recognize that there's community here navigating these challenges, these emotions uh, together. Heartbroken. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. Mm hmm Thank you for sharing. I'm seeing these. I'm seeing all these and they, I feel them. And I, I extend care for having to share and feel those feelings. Um, please keep adding if there's words that come to you, if there's something that you feel like you need to get out, that's that's good and share and happy to happy to bear witness to that as well. So as we move through these concepts and feelings, um, you know, how, how we're feeling about these issues, um, leading into this idea of messy hope and thinking about 
what that means in relationship to our anger and our grief and our anxiety and our frustration and our rage and our helplessness or hopelessness. Um, and when we talk about the role of climate hope, it's really important to remember that we shouldn't be looking to simply replace anyone's climate anxiety or grief or rage with ideas of climate hope or optimism. Um, these are not binary or zero sum siloed emotions. They are fundamentally coexisting. They're co-informing uh, feelings and emotions. And so we recognize that these exist simultaneously side by side many times. And that's understandable. We're human, we're complex. Um, so thinking about uh, hope and happiness and joy as often being important part of helping us move through, find pathways, not through like we're leaving it behind, but in those moments of deep, capital D-E-E-P, for example, grief, what does um, messy hope or shared collective joy offer us? And this actually reminds me of um, when my dad passed away and there was an immediate natural desire to share humorous and tender stories. Uh, we cried, we laughed, and we celebrated his life. But while honoring deep loss together, shared in a collective space, and it was this honoring of deep loss in a wave of messiness that really made it possible. And it sometimes feels wrong to be laughing or joyful amid moments of deep grief or sorrow. But at the same time, as human beings, it's what helps us navigate. It's what helps sustain us. It's what helps make it possible uh, in community and relationship with each other. And there's a deep beauty in being able to, to do that. Um, and in doing so, it definitely eventually helps to lighten the load. Uh, and, and that is something that we can share with each other in, in being able to identify our feelings, identify our grief, and then also find ways to laugh about it and share about it and, and honor it. So being messy there is okay. Um, and then we also you know, recognize that when we are thinking about our grief and thinking about these ideas of hope, um, Offering and allowing ourselves spaces to process and grieve personally or collectively, kind of like what we're doing in the shared space today by identify, being vulnerable and identifying what those feelings are for us. Um, it can be cathartic and, um, and community building and also offers a way to find, again, those me messy pathways um, using hope and joy through some of those really difficult challenges. So I'm also, I'm seeing some... Um, stuff in, in the chat. I haven't had a chance to go back and read that yet. So I'll go back and read that. But, um, and I hope it's also really important because there's actually research on this um, that indicates that framing climate messaging and actions through lenses of hope and collaborative solutions-based mindsets, for example, are actually more effective at mobilizing both individual and collective climate interests and actions. So as a community, we should always be asking the question, how are we framing climate-related solutions for more hope-filled community uptake? And that's something that we can think about is using this idea of hope and joy and happiness uh, to, to draw people in and say, yeah, it's hard, but how do we do this together? How do we root ourselves in joy and care and do it together? Oh, I don't know what happened there. Oh, I think I clicked on a link. Um, so one of the next things, that being said, again, thinking about framing, thinking about how we talk about climate change or like calling people in, um, being conscious of, of what are the values that we use to do that. And values are a really important dynamic that maybe help us navigate different types of that climate denialism, for example. So how do we think of values as a bridge um, between polarization or between community uh, differences or between different ideological ways that we might see the world. And values can create common ground um, across communities. So how do we identify and reflect on our shared values? To, to create that common space for coming together as a community, we may not need to even say the words climate change or climate justice. We may need to just frame it as um, a public health issue. And do we both care about or are we both invested in uplifting public health? Um, I did see somebody in the chat share that story about the young, uh, the young boy uh, child who, who passed away. They had extreme asthma and the wildfire smoke was a contributing factor to that. And that 
is horrifically tragic. Those, those, that poor family, those parents, um, that life impacted. And so this is a public health issue at the same time. This is something about clean air. This is something about clean water. This is something about water access amid drought. What is the value there that we can identify and share and connect with, um, with each other, even though we might not have the same world views, for example. And so I call folks here into that too. What is a common value in your community that is important for climate mobilization? What do you see? And again, there's no right or wrong answers to this, but like, how are you, how do, how are you called to understand values? And what does that kind of trigger for you? in relationship to the issues we're exploring today or the, the issues or impacts you see in your community. What are, what are values that might cut across community divisions or polarizations or interests? I see somebody say safety. Yeah, and that's a big one. Emotional safety, physical safety, material safety. Um, there's so many dynamics to that. Protecting our community, yeah. Physical safety from fire, absolutely. Housing, yes. How are we valuing um, housing, affordable housing, co-op housing, housing everyone um, as, as part of community care? Being proactive. The beauty of our natural surroundings, yeah. And you know, rooting in, in love of shared nature and community and, and ecologies is a really good way to bring community uh, interests together as well. Yeah, getting to that economy, money and business being affected. Yeah, insurers are pulling out of, um, insurers are pulling out of, of um, offering insurance in, in flood and fire impacted communities in many parts of the states, well, in, in parts of Florida and parts of um, California, for example. So, recognizing how this is impacting businesses as well and, and homeowners and, and all that kind of thing. Okay, so then I'm gonna touch on this idea of resilience because we're kind of building an arc here. We're kind of going through like, what is the distress? Um, what is grounding us in hope and care look like? Uh, what are some values that we can draw on or look to? And then there's this idea of resilience and it's a complex concept. Um, it's, it's simple but complex at the same time. We hear this word resilience a lot, um, and it's, very, it's a very complicated term. Um, and one of the most important things I think folks need to kind of connect with on this idea of resilience is that it's a verb and not a noun. We don't just do different things and strategies and actions and get to resilience as an end point and we've kind of checked off a box. Resilience is a verb, it's an action, it's ever evolving and ongoing. Um, we have to make sure that the communities, that the systems, that the um, concepts that we engage are constantly evolving and adapting to community needs. Uh, because if we, if the evolving and adapting uh, stops in relationship to resilience, then we become out of touch with being able to be resilient. And so it's an ever evolving concept and term that is a whole bunch of different things that creates this idea of resilience, this capacity for resilience. Um, so it's experiential. We should always be experience, experiencing resilience. Um, and so again, thinking about it always morphing and priming. Um, there's also a really complicated dynamic of resilience where resilience has been long weaponized against indigenous communities, black communities, communities of color, um, and this idea of being able to be resilient in the face of disaster or harm or strain or stress when the systems themselves have been designed to annihilate or oppress or minimize the ability to thrive and be well um, in these communities. And so saying a community is resilient amid these systems without addressing the systems causing the harm, um, that's where resilience can get really um, weaponized. And so being mindful of how we use resilience and what we intend resilience to mean or do. So failure to address the inequities that co-inform resilience capacities fundamentally will undermine our, our ability to be resilient um, as a community. Yes, yes. It's both, yes, yes and, absolutely. Thank you, Maddie. 
And so thinking then about resilience and this idea that resilience is a mix of different actions and things and um, experiences and mindsets, what is it that we think we can connect with in our communities to, to make change, to mobilize community, to uplift community? Um, it might be something small. It might be working on housing affordability. It might be uh, food security. It might be a clean air initiative. It might be greening trees or, or greening communities. But this idea of knowing I can take action with, within my community makes me feel what? So if we were able to mobilize in our communities in some way, with some skill, with some action, how does that make you feel? I see empowered in the chat here. And there's no right or wrong here. It's just that idea of if I can take action in my community, how does that make me feel? I see the word hopeful here, hopeful at first and then overwhelmed because there's such a large amount of work to do. Yes, yes. So recognizing that where do we start and then where's maybe that boundary of getting overwhelmed. Hopeful, weary, and apprehensive. Yes. Slight control over overwhelming issue. Yeah. Recognizing the micro to macro. Recognizing that sometimes we can just control something small in front of us, but it's connected to much more and many more things around us as well. But then being able to kind of focus our awareness on that and say, what, what can I do today? And it doesn't always have to be big and it doesn't always have to be world changing, but sometimes we need, and we're going to look at different uh, strategies of, of engagement or just um, layers of engagement. And so this is the scales of action. So a lot of you really honed in right away on that, like I can do something, but then it's like, whew, it gets overwhelming quick because of the interconnectedness of life and systems and communities. And so one of the things we really focus on is the different scales of action. So thinking about the systems level, the community level of the individual level. A lot of climate work focuses on the individual level because fossil fuel companies have done a really fantastic job of making it the individual's fault for climate change and making the individual's job to solve it. And there's a really immense power connected to in individual action too. It's really important. We need it because we need individual strategies that offer us a sense of empowerment, a sense of agency. We also recognize that individual actions scaled up can be very powerful and create waves of movement and, and um, shift, tipping point shifts and things like that. Um, so individual level is really important but then also looking at how we engage in community and how we engage in systems level in relationship to climate change. Life is lived at the community level. We live amid community. Uh, and so thinking about how we can connect with community and build community momentum and cohesion, and then help to create those norm shifts in the via individual work, but then into community work um, towards community futures that are um, rooted in things like justice and equity and empathy and dignity reciprocal care. And then we have the systems level change. It's harder, but it's important. And it is where we're ultimately heading with a lot of the climate work that we do to change those systems that are ultimately fundamentally the root causes of climate change at the same time. And so what are those systems level? What do they look like? How do we address them? Um, and this is something we can chat about um, as well. So thinking about our connections to systems and, and how we maybe even change systems, what does that even look like? And here's some examples um, that I have on the slides here of systems change. So prioritizing anti-racism and equity building across communities, addressing legacies of white supremacy and colonialism in city systems, planning and policy choices, transition uh, community away from fossil fuel dependence, which we know is a core driver of, of climate change impacts, voting to empower climate leaders where we can, um, and promoting circular economy approaches as opposed to capitalist extractive economies, for example, and then we have this leverage point at the community. So being a leader and educating about the mental health and well-being impacts of climate change, just what we're doing here today, for example, 
um, create community goods, uh, sharing networks. For example, on my street, uh, I know my neighbors fairly well, and we share uh, tools, we share ladders, we share all sorts of um, goods uh, across that community so that we don't have to purchase them all. Um, promoting affordable housing, co-op housing models in your communities. Uh, get to know your neighbors. Your neighbors are your first line of, of support and defense in a, any emergency system. And so the more you know your neighbors, um, the more likely you are to have resilient opportunities and capacities when uh, there are strains and stresses that you're experiencing. Um, advocating, like for example, strains and uh, like thinking about a flood or a heat wave or a wildfire uh, situation, for example. Um, advocate for redirecting fossil fuels, throw a block party. Um, research finds that throwing a block party to build community connection and cohesion is a really powerful um, action and strategy for creating change in community structures. Uh, again, greening underserved or under-resourced communities. And then at the individual level, of course, still critically important, nourishing your mind, body, and wellness. Stepping back from doom scrolling or feeling like, you know, there's this step in, step out. If you are overwhelmed, staying engaged in that overwhelmed space may not be something that you are are capable of doing and that's okay there's other folks always stepping in as you maybe are stepping out and take that space for yourself that's okay we need to give permission to ourselves and to others to say i see you're overwhelmed you might be experiencing burnout it's okay to step back for a minute you're not failing and you're not you're not letting people down you're not stepping away from from the the climate mobilization um, other people can step in for you well you need to take a step back as well. Um, because if you're burnt out, it doesn't help in the long vision of climate organizing. And so taking care of ourselves and each other is, is critical in this work that we do. And we can't be all things all the time. And, and giving ourselves grace um, to, to not have to be and not hold ourselves to that standard, unrealistic or an unattainable standard, and being gentle with ourselves as well as we go. Um, so this is my last question, and it's it's something that we can kind of lead into conversation, I think, as well as what is one skill I can use to take climate action into my community? One of the questions I hear from students when I do workshops with students is, um, what do I do? What do I do? And they don't, they aren't sure how to connect what they're interested in or their skill sets to to climate work. And so an example of that is I had a student um, say, I'm really passionate about addressing the opioid crisis, the toxic drug supply, and I don't see how that connects to climate change. And so we just had a quick conversation about how this is really powerful. That work is really powerful climate work um, because it's community health work. It's community safety work. It's it's um, if you're addressing toxic drug supply, then you're also addressing um, uh, housing. You're also addressing um, economic uh, precarity. Uh, you're also addressing community resilience. So being able to see how that contributes to climate work was a really powerful moment for them to not feel like they're not part of the movement of climate work in their community. So uplifting community well-being is helping us to uplift how we deal with and navigate climate change as well and climate change impacts. So thinking about your own skills, thinking about your own um, beautiful talents that you bring into the world and how we can help each other leverage those in ways with tweaking that towards climate action or climate work or community care. Again, we don't even have to use the word climate in there because community work and community care, we understand it to also be climate work. Those are interrelated. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, I feel like that was a very quick, these these are, are meant to be big issues. And so I, I know there's a lot to unpack. I know there's a lot to navigate and I don't, I don't mean to rush these issues because they are big, they are complicated, um, they're profound in many ways. And so I really want to make sure that the community here doesn't feel like we're just glossing over something. Um, I, I hope folks feel that there's an opportunity to share uh, I feel I hope there's an opportunity to to take some lessons from this and think about how it might help you in the work that you do uh, and in different ways that we can move forward together. Thank you so much, Megan. I'm gonna stop the recording now.